I want to give a special shout out to all my patrons first. Thank you so much to my Biblio Spren, Biblio Howlers, Biblio Menser, and my new Biblio Menser, Jen. It means a lot to me that you give me this extra support toward my passion and hobby. Hi everyone, Peter here. Today I will be doing another book review, a spoiler-free book review to one of my most anticipated releases of this year, The Will of the Many by James Islington. And I will just get started immediately. And this is not an exaggeration, but The Will of the Many by James Islington is the best fantasy book with a magical school trope I've read since The Name of the Wind by Patrick Rodfuss. James Islington instantly became one of my favorite authors with the Lycanius trilogy. His first series. Ever since then, ever since I finished the Lycanius trilogy, I knew I would need to read every book written by him. And that's why The Will of the Many, along with Lightbringer by Chris Brown and the Four Secret Project novels by Brandon Sanderson, reached the top of my most anticipated release of this year. It is not a good habit to have a very high expectations towards any book as it makes us prone to disappointment. But I couldn't resist it here. I didn't know what the story in The Will of the Many would be and still I entered this book with a very high expectation because I love how Arlington satisfyingly concludes the complexities of the Lycanius trilogy. And fortunately, Arlington managed to exceed my incredibly high expectations with The Will of the Many, the first book in the hierarchy series. As far as the first book of a series goes, this one tops over the shadow of what was lost in every possible way. And I think many of you know just how much I love the Lycanius trilogy. To be more precise, The Will of the Many is James Arlington's best novel in his career so far. It is, at the very least, even though it's a different kind of book, up there with the quality produced in the light of all that falls. This is a contender for the best book of 2023 for me. By the end of this year, and I know the competition is fierce, I will be shocked if The Will of the Many is not in my top 5 books of the year. And I will tell you why in this spoiler-free review. The Catanan Republic, the hierarchy, may rule the world now, but they do not know everything. He tells them his name is Vis Telemus. He tells them he was orphaned after a tragic accident 3 years ago, and good fortune alone gives him a chance to enter their most prestigious school, the Catanan Academy. He tells them that once he graduates, he will gladly join the rest of civilized society in allowing his strength, drive, and focus, what they call will, to be leashed away and added to the power of those above him, as millions already do, as all must eventually do. Vis tells them that he belongs and they believe him. But the truth is that Vis has been sent to enter the Cadenan Academy to find answers, to solve a murder, to search for an ancient weapon, to uncover secrets that may tear the Republic apart, and that he will never ever cede his will to the empire that executed his family. To survive though, Vis will have to rise to the Academy's ranks. He will have to smile, make friends, pretend to be one of them, and win. If he fails, then those who want to control him, who know his real name, will no longer have any use for him. And if the hierarchy ever finds out who Viz truly is, they will kill him. This is the blurb for The Will of the Many. If you are familiar with Pierce Brown's sci-fi series Red Rising Saga, you might notice the similarities in the premise. For context, in Red Rising, Darrow is a red. The law was ranked in the hierarchy of labor within the color-coded society of the series. The gold is the ruler of humanity, and they have done irrevocable actions to Darrow and the Red for many years. So Darrow has to masquerade as a gold and increase his fame and prestige through the rank of gold to fulfill his revenge. Red Rising Saga is one of my favorite series of all time. And yes, the similarities with Red Rising can definitely be spotted in The Will of the Many. Even more so because Viz has a personality that is quick to anger, like Darrow, and the world building of these two series is heavily Roman inspired as well. More on this later. But more importantly, the premise and the Roman inspired world building are where the similarities end. The Wheel of the Many is a different kind of book compared to Red Rising. This is not like the controversial case that the first binding by R.R. Virdi has with the name of the wind by Patrick Rothfuss. This 240,000 words long novel never felt derivative to me. It's the other way around with more pages read in The Wheel of the Many, especially after the insane ending. 
The more I feel the will of the many as a whole package as expected of Islington is another incredibly distinct, ambitious, and mind-blowing work of art. From my assessment, it would be more precise to say if you love the premise and world-building portrayed in Red Rising Saga, it's very possible you will end up loving the will of the many, especially if you love the magical school or academy setting and trope too. If you've read the Lycanius trilogy, you will know that Plotting is one of the best aspects of the series. I'm pleased to mention that Islington's strength as a mostly planner storyteller, because I believe that every writer is a mix of both, returns powerfully in the will of the many. I cannot stop thinking about all the events that have transpired in this novel and their crazy implications for the rest of this series. Only a special fantasy series can make me feel this kind of effect right after reading the first out of the planned three or four installments. I predict the hierarchy will be more than a trilogy, but that remains to be seen. I am not comparing which one is better here as a storyteller, a pantser, or a planner. However, I believe if Islington has showcased the best aspect of being a mostly planner type of storyteller in the Lycanius trilogy with his meticulous story structure and well-placed revelations. I can already see these factors being implemented magnificently here. This is all splendidly realized without any sacrifice in pacing. The pacing of the book was engrossing from cover to cover for me. The blurb and I have mentioned the enrollment into the prestigious Catanan Academy. I do not think of this as a spoiler, similar to readers talking about Kvothe entering the university in the Kingkiller Chronicle or Harry Potter entering Hogwarts, just a few examples. Both series take place in a magical school setting, the same as the will of the many. But to set expectations accordingly, let me be clear that this tale in the Catanet Academy did not start until we reach part 2 of the book, Deus Nolens Exitus, get results whether God likes it or not. That's 35% into the book, and by approximation, I think about 50% of the story actually takes place in the Catanet Academy. Part 1 of the story, Imperium Sine Fine, An Empire Without an End, was the setup and foundation. This is the introductory section, and it depicts this merciless training montage and preparation under the tutelage of Lanistia before he enters the academy. Additionally, the foundational stage and the training montage were never uneventful. Islington successfully made the three parts of the narrative here have their own overarching story arc, beginning, middle section, and concluding chapters, while being seamlessly connected to one another. If you already have a great time reading part one, you will be gripped with the rest of the book. This, of course, comes with the caveat that the magical school or academy trope and setting is one of your favorites. The Wheel of the Many is a book about ambition, justice, greed, vengeance, friendship, leadership, loyalty, knowledge, and family. And although these were on some level established since part one of the novel, they were extensively integrated into the narrative in part two and part three. In Cauda Venenum, the poison is in the tail. Once this arrived in the Catanan Academy, an academy that rewards greed and victory above all else. A magical school troupe in fantasy is constantly irresistible to me. I have no idea when I will be over this trope, but it seems like it's not happening anytime soon. I am confident in that. I cannot help it, okay? Whether in novels, in manga, or in video games, I have many of my favorite adult fantasy stories starts or centers in a magical or battle school setting. It's one of my favorite tropes of all time. There's just something about training montage, learning new abilities and skill, overcoming challenges, and defeating bullies or horrible teachers while forming friendship that always feels satisfying and relatable. These factors in a fantasy novel paired with the magical school trope and a main character that earned my investment have a good chance of being included in my list of favorite fantasy books. They are some of my favorite escapism, assuming they are done right, of course. And The Wheel of the Many is a good example where all of this were infused incredibly well. A few comments have stated they did not feel connected to the main characters of the Lycanius trilogy due to its heavily plot-focused storyline, except for Caden. Although I do not fully agree with this notion, because I like Davian, Weir, Asha, and many characters in the trilogy enough, I certainly agree Caden is the best character in the Lycanius trilogy. 
Caden is one of my favorite characters in the fantasy genre. It is with a heart full of happiness, I say it is very likely this will become a character I cherish as much as Caden in the future. Try not to misinterpret what I said as a criticism toward the Lycanius trilogy. The Lycanius trilogy is one of my favorite trilogies. My point is that Islington has developed further as a storyteller. With more books in the series available in the future, the potential for higher Erky series to be better than the Lycanius trilogy is strongly evident. If I am already this compelled and invested in this and his story just from reading The Wheel of the Many, what would be the outcome after reading the sequels? I am excited to find out. Whether the obstacles to our advancement arise from our ties or our actions, we need to learn to overcome them ourselves. It's not fair, but nor is the world. I found this to be a character reminiscent of Kvot or Darrow. Forged by his brutal past, the rigorous physical and mental training he partakes since he was a young age has acted as an eternal fire of motivation that transformed him into a skillful fighter, intelligent, resourceful, a quick learner, and a jack of all trades. In other words, Viz is great at many things. However, he is not flawless. Viz lies a lot for survival, and he is often blinded by rage. This uncontrollable crimson veil of wrath often leads him into trouble or iconic moments, depending on how you look at the situation. His capacity for violence and fury is a weakness he needs to tame, and he soon realizes he cannot do everything all by himself. This is why the unlikely friendship he forms in the academy, especially with Kalidus and Aidin, give him solace and hope amidst all the dangers, loneliness, and life-threatening allegiance that he has to juggle. Moments of virtue, loyalty, and solidarity were relatively rare and hard-earned. But the warmth of each one of these occurrences felt palpable. They radiated from the pages. All of this, along with this inspiring courage, determination, and compassion, reinforced the unputdownable narrative for me. Islington's improved prose was responsible for my immersion and connection with the novel. Islington successfully nailed this personality and voice so damn well. In science fiction and fantasy novel, it is frequently crucial for me to be able to feel the character, the POV character, is telling the story, not the author. The narrative has to completely enthrall me in the POV character's narration and inner thoughts. The best kind of science fiction and fantasy authors can do this. Here are some examples of an SFF series with excellent first-person POV narration. Fit in the Realm of the Elderlings by Robin Hobb. Kvot in the Kingkiller Chronicle by Patrick Rothfuss, Darrow in the Red Rising Saga by Pierce Brown, and Thomas Piety in War for the Rose Throne by Peter McLean. These four characters' narration felt like the author became the messenger with a mission to write and deliver their tales. And that precisely is what has been accomplished in The Will of the Many by James Islington. Islington's writing style has the ability to conjure vivid imagery in my mind and an engaging reading experience effectively. And these praises are not exclusive to this. The entire story is told from the first-person POV in present tense narration of this. And yet, I still feel like I got to know all the supporting characters' motivation and personality almost as well as this. They are all unique with their own qualities. Finally, before I close this long enough review, I want to elaborate on the world building of the series. When I read The Will of the Many, it hit me that I haven't read as much Roman-inspired epic fantasy series as I thought. I think this is a factor that increased my reading enjoyment. There is Codex Alera by Jim Butcher, a popular Roman-inspired fantasy series, but in my opinion, The Will of the Many is multiple times superior. The world building feels relatively fresh. Many aspects of the world building in The Will of the Many are deeply rooted in its Roman inspiration. The names, clothing, beautiful vistas, settings, in-world game, and more. Every aspect of the Roman-inspired world and Islington's crafted fantasy lore were delivered in detail gradually. I did not feel overwhelmed by the terminologies. There is a character list and glossary at the back of the book every time I need to remind myself of something, and it did not take long for me to feel immersed in this Roman-inspired epic fantasy series. And I loved it. The gladiatorial bouts, the naumachia, the katanen rankings, and how the magic system 
will, which I'm sure we will see even more of its usage in future sequels, is interweaved into the story. Everything felt so natural to the plotlines. Plus, there is, of course, Islington's own creation in the manifestation of the mystery of the ancient weaponry and cataclysm, a world-spanning disaster three centuries ago that left less than five people in every hundred alive. Maybe it is more accurate to call The Will of the Many and the series an epic science fantasy series due to how the high fantasy aspect and scientific technologies merge and enhance the narrative. And I, as a fan of having more sci-fi elements in epic fantasy, am totally pleased by all of these combinations. The character's development, in-depth lore, technologies, and history established in The Will of the Many have provided possibilities for the will and mysteries of the cataclysm and more to be explored further in the next installments. This is also a darker novel than I expected. Explosions, massacres, shredded flesh and blood, and obsidian, ice and blades, the action scenes, the big action sequences, labyrinth runs, or duels were all tension-packed. Islington displayed the immense terror every second can bring in the lurking presence of disintegration and chaos. Violence begets grief and grief begets violence. Is it a mistake or is it righteous to repay the sorrow caused by the heinous sins of the past with more violence of the present? The will of the many closed the magical or battle school or dark academia portion of the series. And that alone was already super satisfying. But oh my god, the mysteries and implications raised after the final chapters were groundbreaking to say the least. Without spoilers, what Islington did in the epilogue ex uno plures out of one many was nothing short of outstanding. In one chapter, Islington escalated the scintillating novel into something even more extraordinary. You think an octopus who gives his will is somehow less responsible than the sectus who kills with it? The weak and poor injure in the hierarchy because the alternatives are harder, not because there are none. They know the system is wrong, but they choose not to think or speak up or act because they ultimately hope that in their silence they will gain or at the very least, not have to give more than they have already given. They are driven by myopic self-interest and greed just as much as the senators and knights. The decision may have been made by the few, but it's the will of the many that killed your family. My emotional attachment to the events and characters of this book is undeniable. The Will of the Many by James Islington is a phenomenal achievement. Islington has flourishingly crafted a Roman-inspired science fantasy world with brilliant plotlines that feel believable through the perspective of a talented and flawed main character imbued with a superbly distinct voice. I absolutely loved it. It is one of the best books I have ever read. And it is also one one of the rare books where upon finishing it, I immediately want to reread from the beginning. And I know I will do that when the sequel, The Strength of the Few, is near. The waiting time for the sequel will be one of the worst waiting times I need to endure. How could it not be after the intense and insane culmination of the book? But until then, I will be patient. Audi, vide, tace. Hear, see, be silent and read The Will of the Many as soon as possible. A new exceptional science fantasy series destined to become a classic is here. The Will of the Many has everything I love in an epic science fantasy novel, and many scenes here will become eternal moments in my mind. So yeah, that's it. That's pretty much why you should read The Will of the Many by James Arlington. I absolutely love this book. As I said, this is a big contender for my favorite book, of the year. But then again, there is still Lightbringer by Chris Brown. I still want to read Sun Eater by Christopher Rocchio and also the Austin Art Saga by Ted Williams. So the competition this year will be fierce for me. But this is The Will of the Many. It will be the early contender for my favorite book of the year. So yeah, that's pretty much it for me today. Do let me know whether you plan to pick up this book or not. I know that there is still two months before this book comes out. But yeah, do let me know whether this is on your radar or not. If not, you should really put it on your radar. So yeah, that's it for me today. As always, thank you so much for watching and thank you for your support. Bye-bye. Lastly, I want to say thank you so much once again to all my patrons who keep on supporting me.